Good afternoon. My name is Annie Williams, and I'm an intern at Somerville Media Center. And today I'm happily to be joined by Julia Tellison for the news roundup for um, Wicked Local and Somerville. How are you doing today, Julia? I'm good, Annie. How are you? Doing good, thanks. Um, so I think the first part of the agenda, we're going to talk about COVID testing. Um, they've made, um, Cambridge Health Alliance has made some changes about that recently. Do you want to start off and talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I always like to start off these roundups by talking about COVID-19 because it may be summer, but we are still in a pandemic. It makes right. me very sad, but I think it's important to remember that there's still a lot of important public health information that we all need to kind of stay aware of. Um, so yes. Um, so Cambridge Health Alliance for a while has been doing testing out of the Somerville Hospital testing site, kind of up behind the hospital. Um, but recently, they have moved their testing site to uh, Assembly Square. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, I don't, it may change again. Um, we'll see. Um, but kind of as of now, that's where we're at. Um, so it's still kind of the same deal as like where it was. You have to call the hotline number to set up an appointment. Um, you do not have to have insurance. You do not have to be showing symptoms. Um, people are encouraged to get tested um, regardless of whether or not you're showing symptoms, but definitely if you feel you may have been exposed. Um, so it's still a resource that is available. Um, and another thing to kind of keep in mind is that um, for a while testing was restricted, um, but I believe at this time, the latest kind of guidance from CHA is that all CHA patients, as well as some of our residents and any residents in their kind of service area, which includes Malden, uh, Medford, Cambridge, um, Everett, I think parts of Arlington, um, are eligible for testing. So if you need testing and you're having trouble getting it, maybe through your primary care or something, you should call the number and they should be able to support you. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. Um, one thing though, um, we're kind of, you know, still bringing some coverage to this, but we have been hearing from residents that is the relatively long wait time to get tested, okay. which is concerning some people. Um, according to CAJ, this has more to do with a lack of testing materials than it has to do with more people suddenly needing to be tested. Mm -hmm. um, we released a story um, on the 14th, so last week, um, and they at the time were saying like the kind of number of people per day that need to be tested or are calling to be tested has gone down. Um, you know, there's still a good amount of people, but the kind of wait time has more to do with the fact that we don't have enough reagents, which is like what you kind of put the swabby thing in. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so intellectual when you get a test. Um, so and it like will, you know, tell you whether or not you're negative or positive. So um, I believe they're not the only regional healthcare facility that's dealing with this. Um, but it's kind of just a reminder that, you know, there are still kind of um, some breakdowns going on in our supply chain when it comes to, you know, managing this pandemic. Um, but it's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, it's something we welcome, you know, kind of feedback on if residents are experiencing a long wait time or concerned about it, you know, please reach out to us, reach out to CHA. Um, and we're, you know, we want to hear your experience of it. Um, the other thing I just want to like check in on um, is kind of just like where Somerville is at with all of this. Um, so as of, as of the 21st, July 21st, um, which is a Tuesday, um, we kind of finally cracked a thousand. So over a thousand, um, at the, at that time, 1,026 people had tested positive, um, almost a thousand and 979 have recovered. And so far, sadly, we've had 34 confirmed fatalities. Um, the number of new cases per day is still pretty low in Somerville. Um, but kind of as you know, all of us watch what's going on around the country, um, and even just around the state in terms of business reopenings and case numbers, uh, increasing, um, the mayor, uh, Mayor Credatoni, recently announced that phase three business reopenings were going to be delayed again. So initially they were delayed to the 17th of July and now they were delayed to August 3rd at the earliest. Um, but I think I think we may see a delay later. I think a lot of us don't really know what's going on, especially kind of facing down what might happen in September with schools um, and universities opening back up. Um, we're not really kind of sure where that's at. So, I mean, I, I'm not at the city level. I, you know, I'm not sure exactly where they're going to be coming out with more guidance. Um, but everything we've seen thus far is that Somerville has been pretty cautious when it comes to this stuff. Um, so yeah, I think that's where we're at with COVID at the moment. 
Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah, everything is kind of unfolding in real time. So it's sort of a a, a day-to-day thing. And I think that, you know, and, and it's like you said, you know, we still need to be reminded that we're in a pandemic and we have a lot of challenges that that come with that. And you know, it, it's a, it's a hard time for everybody, but, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for staying on top of that. And thank you for checking in about that. Um, let's, um, move on. Do you want to talk about, so we, you have a, you just put out an article about the uh, budget approval update for the fiscal year of 2021. Do you want to go over a little bit about what that details? Yeah, sure. Um, So it was quite the budget process, (laughs) anyone who's been following it. And actually um, at the, at the, on the night that the budget was approved, um, counselor, Ward 2 counselor JT Scott mentioned that this was like the year of the highest engagement in the municipal budget process that he's ever seen. Um, So many people have been following the process. Um, but it was an interesting year. Um, typically, the budget is kind of the city kind of puts together a budget, brings it to the city council in like early June, and the city council takes the month of June to like review it, and then they approve it by the end of June because the new fiscal year starts on July first. That did not happen this year <laughs> for many many reasons. Um, first of all, because of all of the just like changes in revenue that the city was facing because of all of the COVID business closures. Um, the city had a really tough job putting together a municipal budget. There were a lot of cuts to consider, which program should we keep, which one should we not, like where can we kind of take funds out of and put somewhere else. And it was a really complicated year. So the administration did not bring a budget to the city council until June 19th. Um, So the city council had either had to approve it in essentially, I think like six days of meetings, like weekdays, um, or they needed to extend it. So what happened this year was they did start meeting immediately, but they voted to do like a kind of a one month budget on the last day of June, pretty much, um, which would like kind of carry them over until they were able to approve a fiscal year budget. Um, but they didn't, they didn't need the whole month of July. So on July 14th, they finally approved a fiscal year 21 budget after many, 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 many hours of meeting. Um, I think you know some of the important highlights of this year. Um, really, I think the one is is the conversations around the police budget um, that were kind of born out of um, some the protesting around George Floyd's death um, on May twenty fifth, and just this conversation around like what policing should look like in our community. Um, and while many residents did call on the um, council to defund the police by at least ten percent. Um, and like many asked for 60%, um, that did not end up happening quite as much. Um, I believe they ended up cutting, um, the city and the council combined cut about $742,000 from the police budget, um, which I believe adds up to a bit more than 7% of the budget. Um, but I think what was really notable about this year, um, which is not just me, many counselors, um, noted this as well, um, is that. In past years, when city councilors have made cuts, sometimes that money has either gone into kind of a stabilization stabilization fund or maybe like everyone's taxes have gone down like just a little bit. But this year, the city took the directives that the city council recommended. So if the city council said, I'm cutting this much and I want the city to reallocate it into the Office of Housing Stability. Right. Technically, the city is not mandated to do that. It's up to the mayor and the mayor's office. But this year they did. So it's actually really cool because the budget process included a whole, like they made all these cuts and then the city came back before the council with an amended budget. And it included putting those funds, which they had cut from the police, from public works, from other departments into the office of housing stability for more case managers to support people who have, you know, housing problems in Somerville um, to support bilingual caseworkers in um, you know, the food security office and HHS, um, in the immigration office. Um, so it was a really cool year, I think, because of that. It was just, it was really different, different to cover from last year. Um, but we do, we have a couple articles up about it. If you want to kind of get in the weeds about it, we have some charts on like what was cut, where it was reallocated, et cetera. So I won't go like deep, deep into detail. Um, but it was a really interesting year. So yeah, definitely take a look at that. Yeah, very exciting. Um, I noticed that there was something called uh, the it was it's a new racial and social initiative that they had started recently. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. If you have any information about that, that sounded really interesting to me. 
Absolutely. Um, so the racial and social justice initiative was something initially proposed um, during like the kind of initial budget presentation. For, um, it's just, it is what it sounds like. It's a new initiative. Um, I think there are there are definitely kind of still ongoing conversations about what exactly it's going to look like. Um, but in this new budget, um, they budgeted for hiring a director of racial and social justice. They are funding a racial and social justice fund, um, which has a number of directives to support um, minority businesses, um, to support um, just generally kind of the struggles of, of people um, in Somerville. Um, what, what else? There, there are a couple layers to kind of what this initiative is. Um, but I think the one of the main ones is that they're hoping to kind of staff, um, essentially staff a, a, you know, a kind of growing department um, or new, a new department um, to drive community engagement around issues of race and social justice in Somerville. And at this point, the main conversation has been around civilian review of the police. Um, so if you kind of have followed the city council budget meetings like I have, which most of you probably haven't, which is fine because there are many of them. Um, what you would have seen is that a lot of the conversations around this kind of centered on like, you know, how are we going to like engage the community in these conversations about what we want policing to look like? How do we make sure that marginalized communities, communities who are the most policed, communities who are the most vulnerable are the ones who are centered in these conversations, who are driving this change. And I think part of the kind of goal of kind of establishing this new position is that this person, that will be one of their like full-time directives is to do that. Um, so it's, and that's kind of, you know, civilian review also, you know, there's nuances to it. The city council for one of the first times ever was granted a budget to help drive this process as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. I, again, I, there's a whole breakdown of kind of how the funding is going to work. There's a timeline in the budget presentation of kind of when things are going to happen and when people are going to be hired. Um, so definitely kind of keep a look on that. But um, th some of the funds were also reallocated into that. That's awesome. Yeah, great. We can definitely, I think we're going to, um, we'll definitely come back to the civilian uh, review because, sure. you know, there's just like, I feel like the, the 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 breakdown of that is is going to be very intricate and also very complicated. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll circle back around that. But um, if you want, you know, the Somerville Museum has a new um, exhibit going up that's being led by uh, Kedrick Roy. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I know his family is involved. Um, this <laughs> is also something that's going to engage the community about racism and racial justice and, um, you know, also taking a look at our own history, um, you know, Massachusetts and how, you know, mm. we have sort of been implicated throughout that. So yeah, go ahead. I'll let you take Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so on July 1st, I think the Somerville Museum kind of started their like summer discussion series, um, which this year which this year is on race, fragility, and anti-racism. Um, it's led by Kedrick and Holly Roy, who are a husband and wife team, super cool, um, and also Somerville residents. Um, Kedrick is also um, a PhD um, candidate at Harvard. He's very cool. Um, I just wanted to talk about this because I, I really enjoyed learning from him. Um, and I think it's a really interesting model. And even though um, the, this specific discussion series, um, I believe registration is full. Um, they meet like every Wednesday night for about an hour. Um, there's been so much response for it that the museum is considering hosting it again. So they have a wait list going, um, Kedrick's all excited about it. Um, so definitely like if you kind of look at this and you're like, yes, like I would love something like this to kind of have more structure and to like keep me accountable to like doing this work. It's a really great option. And it's, you know, it's supporting the Somerville Museum and, um, I just think they're all lovely over there. Um, but it's really cool. Um, I think just to kind of, you know, quickly um, talk about it. Um, Kedrick really just kind of conceived of this course after the, the deaths of, you know, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and others that kind of, um, and after the, the protests kind of really just took off in the beginning of June. Right. Um, and his goal was just to engage the community in conversations about race that were relevant but that also had historical context. Um, so what I find really interesting about this course is that he has these more modern books like White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo and White Rage by Carol Anderson, um, which really are, you know, geared towards white people. It's like geared, it's like anti-racism literature, like for white people. But also a lot of like, if you look at the course material, which is up on the website, 
there are also you have there are many like speeches by MLK. You watch a couple of speeches by MLK. There's a documentary. Um, I think maybe two documentaries. Um, they're just like 13th, lots of right. Thirteenth is one of them by Ava yep. DuVernay. Yep, correct. Ava DuVernay's Thirteenth um, for Netflix is one of the documentaries. Yep, excellent. Um, so it, and he, when he said that, like he said that he really wanted to like he wanted to like engage people in the now. Like if you look at the like bestseller list, like what White Fragility and White Rage are two of like the top bestsellers right now. Right. But also like remind people that this work started a long time ago and that it still has a basis there. Um, and he said that he's been really getting great feedback. He said, there's like barely a week that goes by when someone doesn't like text him or email him after the class. And they're like, Oh, like, I'm so glad. Like, you know, I found better language to talk to my students or I found better language to like engage my parents in this. And, um, when I was chatting with, um, some real museum assistant director, Alison Jasner, um, she said that most of the participants are from Somerville, but she said that they have like, I think she, they, she said like they have someone from like Concord and even as far as Florida, like that people are really interested in kind of engaging with this. Um, and even though like, you know, she said that some museum, like their mission is, you know, to like bring the community together. And she said that with this all happening with this pandemic and all of us being so separate and so isolated, like that, that felt hard. It felt like an, almost like an insurmountable thing, but at the same time, a good challenge. And that it's, it's things like this that kind of, you know, make her like excited and like hopeful and like that bring that, that this really is like bringing the community together over like a relevant and important topic. And I think Hedrick said like he has between like 60 and 80 people per week, pretty much like, and people have been showing up pretty consistently, which is a lot of engagement. And one thing that Allison pointed out, she was like, I don't know, like if we were hosting this in person, I don't know if we'd have that kind of engagement, but because it's virtual, like people are willing to kind of show up from their living rooms or wherever, you know what I mean? Um, which is like super weird little silver lining, I guess, of all this. Yeah. Um, but I just thought it was delightful. So if anyone is interested, I'm considering honestly <laughs> signing up myself. Um, they're still kind of doing a wait list for that. Um, and it's just like, if you don't even sign up on the Summer of Museum website, they have all of the reading. If only you, if you only want to check it out for that, go check it out for that. Cause then you might have a place to start for yourself. Right. Yeah, I think I'm going to sign up too. That sounds <laughs> something that I'd be really interested in doing. And you're right, you know, it is it is a it is a weird silver lining, you know, because we're we're in a pandemic and I think that the reason why there's been so much media attention around this issue is because everybody's at home. You know, everybody is kind of forced to look at this issue now, maybe a little bit more intricately than they have before. You know, I know that I remember like, you know, when, when Sandra Bland was murdered and, um, Michael Brown, you know, it, it, you know, it, it was startling to me. And I think, but I think now I've probably paid a little bit more attention to this problem than I have before, you know, because, you know, I am stuck at home and so many others because of the pandemic. So there, it really is, you know, kind of sad because, you know, we're all going, we're all experiencing the challenges, challenges of this in different ways. But yeah, I think that it is really perfect. And I think they are able to reach more people because it is virtual. And I think that that's amazing. I mean, 60 to 80 people a week, I, that I, I'm, I'm kind of blown away by those numbers. I was too. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, that that's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. I I I can't wait to look into that myself. Um, yeah, so let let's let's talk about this civilian review of the police. I had no idea what that looked like until I read your article, and I just really loved um, all of the uh, points that I, I I'm forgetting her name, but you quoted um, an attorney that lives in Somerville. And, you know, she brought up how civilians are going to have the power structure to be able to get an introspective look in policing in their communities. And I was just like, I, she brought up like all of these outstanding points and I was, and I was just sort of like, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's quite a lot. Right. I mean. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, this, this issue is definitely, um, it is, it is in its infancy, kind of in Somerville. This, right. so, so this has been talked about for a while. There are other communities around the country who have tried it and who are still trying out different models of it. Um, but yes, um, so the, the attorney's name is Lauren, Lauren Sampson. She is 
very cool, very knowledgeable. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with her. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I just, I wanted to touch on this because um, I went to kind of sit down and write an article um, about it the other day. And I, I was, my goal was kind of to like write like a deeper look at like civilian review in Somerville. And I kind of sat down and I realized like, we're not there yet. You know what I mean? Like we're still, we're still in the beginning stages of this, but I think it's still important to start, to start talking about, you know what I mean? In the media as well. I know there are already community conversations going on. So what I kind of, what I wanted to do was first of all, just kind of highlight where we're at. So civilian review has kind of been a part of this from, from the beginning. One of the, like back in the very beginning of June, um, when the mayor first made his announcement of declaring um, racism a public health emergency in Somerville in that very long press release, he also made a number of kind of commitments to actions and civilian review was one of them. It wasn't necessarily detailed. You know what I mean? There's still a lot to be worked out, but it was one of the things that he mentioned. And then very uh, shortly, um, I think just a couple of days later, um, well, that week, in the beginning of June, this new organization of people of color in Somerville, Just Us Somerville was forming and Civilian Review was one of their platform points. Um, and since then there have been numerous conversations in the city council, in the budget hearings as well about this topic. Um, and one thing that's kind of notable, um, as we were talking about earlier with the racial and social justice initiative, like it's kind of centered in that, um, but the city council has a budget this year, which they don't usually. Um, of $250,000 to engage, to start like them doing the work of engaging the public on this issue. So, you know, they're, they have to kind of figure out what exactly they're going to use that money for. But um, the city has, you know, made, you know, financial commitments to, to really starting to look at this issue. Um, but yes, Lauren Sampson, I think, made some really great points, um, which I'm happy to touch on. I think, I think the, the most important one is just that like, if we're going to do this, we have to do it. Yeah. And that's, you know, me editorializing, but she, she mentioned that like the, the civilian review agencies need to have power, um, like power to investigate, power to subpoena witnesses, power to hand down discipline. Um, and that those kinds of things are complicated and complex to set up. Um, so that this is, you know, this is going to take time. Um, and, I think um, she kind of, she, she made kind of a, a comparison to like the judicial system in terms of like, um, you know, if you're in court, you only have the material that was like available in front of the court. So like, will the, you know, will the police have an internal investigation? And then will the civilian review board only have access to that material? Will they be able to conduct an independent investigation? Like, what is this going to look like? You know what I mean? They're just there are so many questions that still have to be answered. Um, so I don't have all the answers. I'm just here kind of, um, kind of trying to reflect that like where we're at in this process. But I think just kind of having watched all the budget hearings, seeing the amount of conversations that are happening on this issue, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. So I kind of just wanted to bring it up for that. Right. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And like what came to mind for me when I read about it, and I know that you can't really touch on this. I, I don't, it's like you said, I mean, it's an infancy, mm. it's being worked out, but yeah, I mean, you know, discipline and subpoenas are a problem within our own judicial system. So for, for those types of actions to come so swiftly to people that are civilians, um, yeah, I, I do think it's going to take a while because I think that people that work in the justice system, there's many complications, you know, that even come to those people, you know, between defense teams and things like that. So I'm interested to see how this plays out. Me too. That's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. 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 Um, so why don't you update us on the primary elections, maybe talk about the candidates a little and, you know, their background and, you know, what they're hoping to bring to the um, communities. Oh, sure. I mean, oof. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think, well, first of all, there's a primary race. <laughs> so on September 1st, um, many summer residents will, will, have, will get to vote if they so choose. Hopefully you do. Um, um, for a candidate. So there is um, a contested race in the second Middlesex Senate race. So um, incumbent Senator Pat Jalen is being challenged by Gary Fisher. Um, in the 27th Middlesex District race, um, there are two new candidates because Representative Denise Provo is stepping down. So um, Erica Eiderhoven and Katya Sharp are both running for that seat. Um, and in the 34th Middlesex District, um, incumbent Christine Barber is being challenged by um, Anna Callahan. 
Um, so those are the races that kind of we've got going on in this area for the primary, at least. Um, so definitely something to keep in mind. Um, we um, have done some profiles on them in the past, but most recently we've started, um, I sent out some candidate questionnaires and we have been putting up the kind of responses that they've been sending back. It's definitely just kind of like initial coverage, but I just wanted to kind of get the community thinking about like the fact that there's a primary race and that um, there are candidates they can be reading about. And if people have questions about the candidates, we welcome some feedback. Like, what do you want to know from the candidates who are going to be representing you? Um, so that's kind of just the beginning of our coverage. But the other thing I wanted to note is that, you know, as there's still a pandemic, it's important to kind of keep in mind that voting may not look the same. So Somerville is going to, is sending out vote by mail applications to, I think, every household. Uh, people will still have the option to vote in person. Um, but if you feel safe, know that you have the option to vote by mail. Um, so just definitely make sure you stay on top of that. Make sure you're registered. Um, I don't know off the top of my head the deadline. I believe it's mid-August. I'm so sorry. Um, but make sure you're registered to vote and you're set up to vote however you want to. Um, and keep an eye out for articles from summerville.wickedlocal.com on kind of these candidates and how they're progressing. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the school reopening phase there's sure no yeah let's just throw it in there so yeah. <laughs> really quick um we are kind of starting our reporting on this pretty much anyone who's paying attention will know that there isn't much information at this time which is why it's kind of been hard to write about um because you know there have been some guidelines put out right now on um, the department of um elementary and secondary education has said that they're going to be be, they're going to be putting out some guidelines in the next couple of weeks, but a lot of people are kind of just like waiting, right? We don't know what it's going to look like in August. We don't know what to do. I believe at this time, districts have been asked to prepare three plans, a hybrid plan, a virtual plan, an in-person plan. And um, what I wanted to bring this up is because um, on the 21st, um, the Somerville Teachers Association, which is the Somerville Teachers Union, um, wrote an op-ed, which we published, saying that they are in support of a phased reopening plan, which would essentially kind of begin virtual, phase into hybrid, and then become all in-person, rather than trying to just like wait it out and see like which one makes the most sense, like in mid-August, because their argument is that teachers, if we wait, teachers are not going to be able to adequately prepare for any of them, and it's going to look bad no matter what happens. Um, you know, that's their perspective. I am looking forward to kind of speaking with educators, speaking with parents and families um, about what this looks like, um, because I think there, there are a lot of perspectives here because, you know, the public health angle is, yeah, like people could die, you know what I mean, if we force this too soon. So, you know, that's really serious and we have to be looking at the public health aspect of this. There's also an equity aspect of this, right? So it's like, okay, you know, who is most at risk if we open the schools, but who is most at risk if we don't? Right. Um, and kind of how do we how do we balance those needs? So I'm by no you know in no way an expert on this. I'm looking forward to learning much more about this. Um, but I just kind of wanted to put it out there as something I know the community is clamoring to hear more about. I am too. Um, so I'm really I'm really doing my darndest to kind of reach out and get as many perspectives as I can. Yeah, I, I definitely. And I think um, you know I would I would also be really anxious to talk to you know parents and educators about it because you know, they are obviously the stakeholders in this, in this issue. So it, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. I think that that's kind of, you know, the panic that everybody is experiencing across the nation right now is, you know, how are we going to get our kids back in school, but how are we going to, you know, err on the side of caution and make sure that everybody's safe and, you know, yeah, three plans. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's, that's pretty intense. That's like, i I, I can't even I can't even imagine how much effort and thought is going to go into three different mm -hmm. plans. Um, that kind of that kind of blows my mind a little bit. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, Julia, do you have any final thoughts? Anything else that you want to add? I think that's it. I think that's where we're at, Somerville. That's all I got for you today. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been an awesome discussion. You know, we 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 talked a lot of we talked a lot about some important things, some exciting new things you know, hopefully, hopefully things are, are going to get a lot better pretty soon. Yes. Hope so. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me today, Julia. Thanks for having me, Annie.